Good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure for me to be the moderator of this panel, the first panel on this day, of the closing ceremony of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. So, first of all, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists here. I'll go from that side over to this side. So, first of all, we have Felix. Felix, you're the co-chair of the Global Young Academy. And second to that, you are also a staff uh, member yes. of the ICGB, which is the International Center of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, which is one of the steering committee members for the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. So in that, I would directly dive deep into the first question, which you have a moment to just dive into. And I have noted down for you a very nice question, I believe, which fits very nicely, which is, on a daily basis, you work on the ambitious task of bridging science with politics. So when working with politicians, do you just walk up to them and just explain to them what to do? How do you do that? Yeah, thank you so much, Cyril, for your kind introduction. And well, thank you to the organizer for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here talking with you. Uh, in my role of the co-chair of the Global Young Academy and also part of the ICGEB staff. Um, I, yes, um, in my work, I talk with, um, could be considered as politicians, but I actually I prefer to refer to them as governmental officials because in my work, I belong to the regulatory science group from the ICGEB, and we help uh, governments to fulfill their obligation under international agreements on biosafety and well, in, uh, controversial topics like GMOs, or, you know, genetically modified crops, animals, and so on. So in emerging biotechnologies, so how to regulate this kind of technologies and the government, uh, some governments are anxious, you know, how, how to deal with this. There are international agreements that suggest how to do it in a harmonized way you know, around the world and they ask us to, for help them how to understand that situation and how to regulate it. So I, will, I go there to the national governmental uh, offices and I talk to representants from the uh, environmental minister, agriculture minister, and uh, ministry, and, and so on. Then those teams are the ones that are going to advise the uh, decision makers and the, and the politicians. So I am talking about a three st at least a three-step approach. I ICGEB, talking, providing help, technical help, capacity building activities to governmental officials, and these governmental officials are going to provide the advice to their supervisor, the big guys, politicians. And in any case, I, I do not walk there and, and tell them what to do. That would be <laughs> extremely offensive because they are experts in their field. Uh, I just try to digest what's happening in the science, in the lab bench, what are the... Um, the potential implication of the biotechnologies, let's say, in the environment. And then I digest all this information and synthesize this scientific evidence and put it in the table of the governmental officials. For them, well, you know, with the hope that uh, science-informed decisions are taken eventually. But we can talk, I, I could talk for hours about my work and so on. Yes, thank you very much. Also, thank you for, for keeping it to a short introduction. As you, might have known, uh, as you might have noticed, what we're going to do is I will briefly introduce a person and then this person will answer a question that dives a little bit more deeper into what they do in their personal lives and to in, in, their, in their professional lives on an everyday basis. So you'll learn a, bit, a little bit more about who is on the panel so you can ask the pro uh, appropriate questions that target these people and really, uh, really learn about what you really want to know from exactly these people with this expertise. So first, let so now let me move on to to Hussam, who is I'm really really th I'm really really thankful for you to be on this panel. So Hussam is currently the executive director for Partnership for Development of the Royal Scientific Society of Jordan. Thank you very much for being here. Also, he has been a lecturer at the University of Oxford, and he has also worked with with global players like the U the World Bank and the European Parliament. 
And for you, I have noted down a question which I believe fits also the, the, the situation of time very well, which is what has been the role of the scientific societies, senior scientific societies, like the Royal Scientific Society of Jordan, in such a comp complex process as policy advising? Thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and also as uh, RSS and Jordan, we're very pleased to be part uh, of uh, this, uh, this event, especially because Jordan and RSS has been, uh, have been uh, uh, really uh, supporting the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development since the very beginning. Um, so answering your question, um, it's uh, really much linked to the role of the Royal Scientific Society um, and uh, on the reasons and how it was uh, established uh, about uh, 53 years ago. So RSS uh, was established, so it was a top-down uh, process where uh, it was felt that uh, after the 1967 war uh, next door, uh, there was a need to uh, end the influx of refugees to Jordan. There was a need to ensure water uh, and food security as well as economic development. Uh, and employment, and therefore there was a need for knowledge, for scientific production, locally produced uh, uh, to inform policies uh, and uh, advise uh, the government. And therefore, uh, in 1970, uh, the, the, the government and um, uh, Prince Hassan decided to establish the Royal Scientific Society in order to produce this knowledge in order to advise uh, the sustainable development of, uh, of Jordan. Um, and uh, since then, uh, Jordan and, uh, uh, has been using the services of the RSS uh, in terms of uh, uh, laboratories, uh, but also research centers and uh, uh, academic um, uh, research centers uh, on different fields and topics key for uh, the challenges that Jordan was and is still facing. So in, in particular, we have the Energy Research Center, the Climate Change Research Center, uh, building research centers uh, and also metrology, so uh, setting standards for buildings and uh, uh, the construction of uh, streets and so on and so forth. Um, but this, uh, while it was important to produce such knowledge, it's not just locally produced knowledge, uh, but the role of partnerships. And here comes uh, into play, obviously, uh, my current role, given that I'm the executive director of partnerships, but mainly the role of the, our president, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Sumeya, who probably many of you uh, have met before. Uh, she's been really a uh, key supporter of uh, uh, international scientific partnerships, global partnerships, and science for peace, believing in science diplomacy. And uh, all the partnerships that RSS and uh, Her Royal Highness uh, have established with the uh, IAP, with uh, the GYA, ISC, uh, and uh, YASA, for instance, have uh, facilitated uh, uh, these uh, partnerships uh, and uh, collaborations, exchanging best practices for advising the government uh, of Jordan uh, on, uh, with scientific advice. And also, speaking of science for peace, which is uh, uh, obviously very much needed, uh, uh, especially today in, uh, in our region, uh, we hosted in uh, 2017 the World Science Forum under the uh, theme of science for peace uh, in Jordan. Uh, and uh, speaking of basic sciences, we've always also been uh, very much supporting it. Uh, in fact, we host uh, a Sesame Center in, uh, in Jordan, uh, and uh, uh, Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Sumeya is also on the advisory board of ICTP in uh, Trieste. So uh, basically, yeah, answering your question, uh, we do a lot of reports. We are very much involved for the government. We are very much involved uh, in uh, uh, strategic committees, uh, uh, governmental committees on different themes. Uh, and sectors, uh, uh, for instance, uh, we participated in COP uh, last week, COP28 in Dubai, uh, to advise uh, the government uh, on climate change. Uh, we produced uh, with the government and the Ministry of Environment, the NDC and other relevant reports. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and all, yeah, science diplomacy already mentioned it, but we are really very much working with uh, key partners uh, such as AAAS, uh, uh, YASA and, uh, and uh, UFM to uh, also organize, hopefully in next year, a workshop on science diplomacy. Um, I can go on for hours, but I, I will stop not here. Not, well. not yet, thank not you. yet. <laughs> Wait, uh, we're getting there sooner or later. So, first of all, thank you very much. Now, let's move on from a scienti senior scientific society towards something young. We have on our panel Javier, 
who is the president of the Young Academy of Spain. And he's also the president of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, who has also been on the steering committee for the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. It's a pleasure to have you here. And my question I have noted down for you, since the, since the title of this panel, something that we should all keep in mind, the title of this panel is what can be done so that science is better taken into account in policy making? So the respective question to that would be, how can a young academy influence political decision making and what can they really bring to the table? So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the organizers. I think we should all feel very proud of being here at this party, at this closing ceremony. Uh, celebrating the success of the International Year of Basic Sciences or susta for Sustainable Development. And I see many familiar faces, my dear friend and colleague Michael Sapiro, who has been leading this year, people from the International Science Council, UNESCO, it has been a big adventure. But thank you for the question, because uh, I think it is very important to realize that now the, the National Young Academy has become a, a key player in, um, I wouldn't say just advising, but being involved in policy making. Um, not only in, in, in area of science, but in particular. Let me um, answer your question by explaining how we are doing it in the Young Academy of Spain. So we were created by government in 2019, and that means that we are not a section of the, the Royal Academy of Spain. We are a full-fledged academy. We are an academy no, uh, of our own right. Uh, we have um, a budget which is paid by taxpayers' euros, uh, so uh, that gives us a lot of independence, that is very important. But, uh, but as soon as we were uh, created by our cabinet, um, then the pandemic hit. And of course, that was a great opportunity to realize and to visualize how important science is for solving our big problems. So we immediately start working with government in a very proactive way, how we can help uh, with this crisis. So on a weekly basis, we were providing to the Minister of Science a report on the candidate for vaccines, on better practices. So those, during those weeks, we were reviewing the scientific literature and trying to provide the cabinet with the best evidence to fight a pandemic. So that already put us in a relationship with government that was based on trust and also very different from other academies, uh, they didn't need to wait for months for a report. It was done on WhatsApp. I remember you know, talking to um, the officers from, from government on WhatsApp during those days. Like many other people, we were in a pandemic, so things have to be done quickly. So we, we, our people, the people who were joined in the National Academy, the, the Young Academy of Spain, felt uh, empowered and contributing. That was great. And from that, we have created a relationship of trust with government. They are supporting us big time. And also, we are very proactive in how we th think we can support young scholars in our country. We have a mentoring program. We, we have an um, annual summit that we um, organize every year, um, all kinds of activities. Also, I want to tell you that in addition of being a, a completely independent academy, we have 15 academies in, Sp in Spain, national academies, one of them is the Jan Academy. Um, the way our members are selected is following the global Jan Academy standards. So not, not like traditional academies, we make a call, an annual call, and then it's an international jury, a panel, an independent panel, who pre-select the members of of our Jan Academy, and also that give us a lot of independence and, and credibility. So I think to answer your question, it's all about empowering our members, creating a relationship of trust in a time where uncertainty and actually political paralys paralysis make trust one of the most scarce currencies in our time. And just to finalize, uh, as president of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, uh, I wanted to say two things. One is that you can be a member of a Jan Academy and leading the largest scientific union in the world. There is nothing, again, be having you know, early career scientists leading big international organizations. I feel very proud of my fellow chemists for trusting me for, um, on leading um, IUPAC, a, a very big, important organization. And also, probably because of that, 
This year, we approved the incorporation of the International Younger Chemist Network, a network of almost 1,000 early career chemists within the structure of IUPAC. With that, we not only empower the big network of early career chemists from all around the world, but also we, IUPAC, benefit from this new blood, from these new ideas, new ways of thinking about chemistry and sustainability. So I think with that, I will end. Thank you very much. I, I didn't really look at the time. I was just stunned by your answer. It's really, really interesting and insanely inciting, uh, exciting to hear what you have created in Spain and, and the effect that your Young Academy really has over there. So now we move on to the panelists on my very right. Ruth, thank you very much for being here. So Ruth is the Vice Dean of the University College of London Faculty for Engineering Sciences, and she focuses mainly on interdisciplinary entrepreneurship. She's also on the Frontiers Policy Lab, and she's also the co-director of the University, of, uh, University College of London, Arista Institute. Thank you very much for being here. And your question to start, no, not yet, not yet. Your question to start is, what aspects of science do you believe politics should take more into account, and how can we achieve this? Well, thank, thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to join you, and it's an incredible honor to be here. Um, I think, from my perspective, which obviously comes from a university sector, the biggest challenge we've got to overcome is this one of dialogue. So ongoing dialogue that builds trust, that builds networks. And I think, just to speak to what others have said already, science is clearly key to solving global challenges. We need science to be at the heart of the policy making that is going into sorting out the big challenges that we face, whether that is health or environment or, or justice. And yet, what we're still seeing, even though we've had the most brilliant worked example from 2020 of how science is so critical to these matters, is that science is often still um, on tap rather than at, at, the, at the table. So science is brought in when there's a problem rather than being at the table in those discussions. And I, th I think there's probably two challenges as to why that is the case. The first one within the academic sector is that we don't um, recognize and reward scientists for building those networks, for spending the time that it takes to build trusted and deep ongoing dialogues with people outside of their discipline and outside of their sector. Um, and that's a real challenge because it's not a quick fix. It's very difficult to measure, it's difficult to assess when you're looking at research excellence. Um, and, and it takes time. And I guess the other challenge that we're seeing, particularly in the university sector, is that there is such a wealth of knowledge in the university sector. Every discipline is doing incredible work, um, and, and particularly in the basic sciences. And yet getting that insight out into the real world in a manner that is timely, but also engages with the people who are actually tasked with fixing the big problems seems to be something that we're not excelling at at the moment. So, you've asked me about how we can fix it. <laughs> um, I've got two minutes. So I think one of the things we've got to be really cognizant of is that this is not about science and policy only. It's about scientists and policy makers, and this is at the heart of it. So if we're thinking about how we address the recognition and reward of um, particularly well, all scientists, but particularly early career, uh, early career scientists, who I think find this um, within the current structures, this is a very difficult thing for them. We need to be thinking more broadly. We need to be thinking about the context. And so one of the things that we've put forward as a community of World Economic Forum young scientists is a proposal to enable one million scientists to spend time two hours a week, not in addition to their week, but within their week, to um, engage and to build these co connections and networks. Um, one million scientists, because that's 10% of the active world scientific population in public service, um, and 100 million hours, because two hours a week over the year creates 100 million hours. And the proposal really is that if we could do that, if we could enable scientists to do that, that could really change things in the mid to long term. We would have those networks established that are built on trust, and science would be much more at, at the table rather than simply on tap. And I guess the other one is a more institutional one. It's something that we're experimenting with at University College London, and I'd love to hear what other people's perspectives are 
on this, but, but the experiment we're running at the moment is the Arista Institute, which is a faculty of engineering and faculty of arts and humanities collaboration. And what we're seeking to do is gather the insights from across the STEM subjects and the arts and humanities and think about how we can synthesize those insights into engaging stories that connect with policymakers where they're at um, and seeing how we can do that in the rapid way that's needed and yet incredibly academically robust way that we believe is important. So um, that, that would be my proposal. I have been called idealistic in the past and I can understand why that might be the case, but that's why I think we've got to start somewhere. I mean, if, if someone would call me uh, idealistic, I would probably take this as a compliment, but yeah. <laughs> so actually connecting something that Javier said and what you said, you, you talked about trust and, and you, that your young academy really managed to get the trust from the politics and from the government that you are able to provide very valuable input to the system. And we just heard here that trust is really what would be, in my opinion, would be needed to start this project of one million scientists working for two hours, because that would really be one example where you have two hours put in every week. That's not much. Two hours on a Monday morning, that's, that's not too much. That's probably much less than everybody in this room needs to check their emails every Monday morning. So, so in, in that sense, that's really not much, but it really accumulates also because networks accumulate. If you put in two hours this week, the two hours next week will be much more valuable because you already have the network and it really accumulates very quickly. So let's really dive deep into discussion and, and start a little bit you know, in between. One question I have is, you know, if we want really want to move into, into science advice, so science advising policy, how can we do that as scientists? What skills do we need? What characteristics do we need? We just already talked about network. Network is something that belongs to a person, but not necessarily a characteristic. And how do we achieve the characteristics that we need? What, what's your opinions on that? So I, I would start by saying that when, when you go to policy advising, the first thing you need to do is to go into the listening mode and to be empathetic. You know, policymakers have many things on the table. Um, many of the things that you're not aware of. And sometimes scientists go there with our own reports, with our own data, and do we don't care about what the other people have to deal with. So going to the listening mode, I know I have all the knowledge, I have all the data, then you need to follow. Um, it's very important. That's going to create the trust. The other thing I would say is we need scientists not only from the hard sciences but from all branches of knowledge that's critically important especially when you are going to be telling people how to behave right when we talk about climate change when we talk about pandemic there's a lot about behavioral um, change so all sciences not only the natural sciences and the other thing is you know any kind of science advising it requires as you said some kind of uh, skills and one of the problems we have at universities is that we think we know everything, that we can do everything, um, from administrative work to writing uh, grants, to teach, uh, to do research, and also now police advising. No, you need to do your own training. I was very happy to hear that in Jordan, but also in the, na in the National um, the Young Academy of Spain, we are organizing training programs to do policy advising with experts in communication, with policy makers, so you start to listen, what are the needs from other people. It's all about people, connections, trust. And we need to be aware when, when you talk to policy um, makers that there is no trust on them. There is many times no trust on science. So again, I think this is the time, uh, when, when there is a time of uncertainty, trust is the most scarce currency. Building that relationship is critical. Thank you, Please, um, of course. I 100% um, concur. And I think it possibly comes down to something that I've been learning, which is that we've got very different um, cultures. Yeah. And to bridge a culture, you've got to find a common language. And I think, from my perspective, what we're seeing is that the common language of humanity is storytelling. So it, we need to become absolutely brilliant at crafting narratives. And as you say, listening so we understand what the challenges are, what the um, current obstacles might be in the policy space and, and connecting with, with a story because that will lead to change. Education is very important, but the connecting is what leads to change. 
Actually, let, let me take this ball. First of all, give a quick note to the audience. If you have questions, please, please note them down. We will go soon into a moment where, you, where we can where we engage questions from the audience, and then you can fire all of them at us. Not all of them at once, but, but slowly but steadily. We have enough time for plenty of questions, I will assure that for sure. And now take this and, and throw it over, over to Felix, because what, you, what I asked you was a little bit, how do you approach scientists? And you said you cannot just walk up to them then and, and explain to them, oh, you have to do it like this, which scientists, opt, often, do, they, scientists are often very good at talking. So we just heard, heard that science, uh, scientists have to be really good at listening. And in your introduction, we heard a little bit about that you cannot just walk to a, scient uh, to a politician and, and explain to them that they might be a little bit more insulted than, than advised by it. So then I would like to, like to hear what you are doing, what, what skills do you use in your daily life when talking with politicians? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I think that the scientific advice is an art. No? And as any art, you, you, you need to learn how to do it, how to perform it. Uh, it's not possible, it's not right to improvise no? and, uh, as a scientist and try to provide a scientific advice. Uh, there are mechanisms to learn how to do it. It's not, it's not uh, that quick, but we need to start from somewhere. And in the Global Young Academy, we, we tried very hard to uh, strengthen the capacities of our members in scientific advice. We have a, a science advice working group. We have developed a science, a science advice resource center. Um, uh, we organize time to time um, policy memo writing workshop for our members because this is one of the main aspects for scientific advice. We do not communicate with the same languages between policymakers and scientists. How can we establish a two-way communication when there are two different languages? It's difficult. So we as a scientist, we, we need to learn how they communicate in their groups within themselves and try to speak the same language, of course, um, between quotation mark. And once we have learned how to talk to them, how can we reach their ears, no? speaking the same language, still is not enough. We need to build trust. And I, and I take the, uh, our, the previous comment from Javier and, and Ruth. Um, and the trust building is the more time consuming uh, part of the scientific advice. Because this involves not only a professional, um, let's say, interaction, but it can go beyond. With the policymaker, you need to establish a solid relationship in your background. Once the policymaker trusts on you as a good resource of information, source of information, unbiased information, then they, they can hear you. Because <coughs> in this art of scientific advice, it's possible um, that the advice itself is advocating toward one part of the spectrum of whatever situation, or it could be just uh, providing the complete picture of that particular situation. We can name whatever, peace, climate change, food security, or whatever. So the role of the scientific advice, of a good you know, scientific advice, is to provide the entire situation, the picture, the entire picture, and not, not just advocating for one of the ideas. Let me let me maybe give you a little bit of a hard time here. So there, there's a, there's a quote in that I caught from one of my one of my best mentors, who's actually in the room. I would I will not put out the name. He picked it up from one of the past presidents of a general assembly of the UN, who said that science is the only universal language left in the world. But if science is the only universal language left in the world, why do politicians not speak science? If a UN if a UN president says that, so, so how can it be? Maybe it's a different dialect. Mm, okay. maybe, maybe not. Because this is speaking with different accents. <laughs> uh, le let me tell you why. I mean, this is coming from my experience as president of IUPAC. Uh, even when you speak the language of chemistry, when you provide uh, atomic weights, things that people will believe are, are neutral, it's very different when I'm talking to my fellow colleagues uh, from. Cuba, from South Africa, from China, from Israel, from Russia. You see, uh, we need to be aware of cultural differences and diversity. We tend to think that there is only one language in, in, in science, that science 
doesn't deal with cultural differences, that is unique, that is in the textbook, so it should be the same for everybody. Yeah, there is, there is a little bit of that, but it, is it should be spoken with a different accent. We need to be aware of the cultural differences. We need to recognize the science that at local level, you know, in their communities. So, um, yeah, there is a little bit of that, to be aware of, of the cultural differences and appreciate and empower the local communities. But, but that also includes indigenous science, right? So, so science from that is not very classical or very, you know, from the historical point of view, the classical way of science, but also a, co a completely different approach to science. Also to the community, to the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. I will, I will try to include, include you as soon as possible. We have, again, people with microphones in the room. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, so, so there, there's, there's a person directly, directly in the middle, if that person could, be, could get a microphone. To, you, to your right, to your right, there's one coming. Please introduce yourself, Berli. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jukka Marman and I present uh, the Council of Finnish Academies. Uh, I think, uh, and I have some experience in, in trying to answer this question in my country. It is all a question of person-to-person -person relationships. You must know people. It's a dialogue. I give an example. You, many of you may know how, who was our previous prime minister, a young lady called Sanna Marin, who became actually an international celebrity. Her government was very interested in listening to us. So they approached even the academies, and, and we had a, a kind of intergovernmental uh, council where, where, where uh, they really listened to us. And that's because they were interested and we had good personal connections with members of the, of the government. Uh, it was the pandemic time, and that certainly helped a little bit, because uh, her government was very keenly following all the advices of the scientists, how to deal with the, the pandemic. Now we have a new government. They couldn't care less about science. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit here. They are very interested in, in trying to mend the budget deficit in the country. There is no common council, no working group anymore between us and, and, and the new government. Uh, why I'm telling this? Yes, because now it's our, our task again to try to establish the dialogue to try to convince them that they need us, and we need them, of course. So this a long uh, talk of mine can just be crystallized that it's a question of human-human relationships dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, so there's a case where two different governments really didn't speak the same accent of science. That's very clear. So, so let me maybe take this and, and, and say, how can we foster this, this human human interaction what what do we have to do of course you know in person meetings as we do right now is, is of course one one way to do that we we heard about building trust so what how can we foster this human human interaction really to make sure that we that we can engage with the with the politicians how can we engage with the respective government yes please yeah um, building on this and trying to answer it i think it's also about um spending time with the, and listening to the policymakers to understand what are the challenges that they are facing, uh, what are their weaknesses or weak point uh, in terms of policies that uh, they're gonna face and there try to uh, explain uh, what are uh, the, the strength of uh, the scientific community, of our institutes. And um, so it's about networking and listening to them. But at the same time, it's also about uh, representing and networking within our institutes, especially uh, institutes such as uh, National Young Academies or uh, the Global Young Academies or so w institutes that represent and bring together different uh, scientists to uh, ensure that we are aware of uh, the different uh, expertises that we have within our institutes and therefore then try to connect uh, the, the, the our experts or academics within our country or region with the policymaker in order to uh, provide with advice. So it's 
about understanding them and understanding who we are and who we, who we can count on and then try to uh, connect and uh, uh, link the points. We, we directly have another question from the audience, directly behind the microphone, yes. Yes, my name is uh, Boris Engelson, I'm a local journalist, freelance. Someone referred to the UN General Assembly. If I'm not mistaken, the uh, Secretary General of the UN is a scientist, at least he, is a, he used to be professor of electronics and a Portuguese socialist. And that might be the problem. Is, isn't Mr. Guterres the proof that scientific logic and consistency and green, pink social engagement along the SDGs are at odds. That's first remark. The second, maybe the future of science lies outside the faculties of science. I will just give you one or two anecdotes. I know someone who was a translator, a student or assistant in translation. He realized that in the faculty in Geneva, translator had courses in translating law, translating economics, etc., but not science. He proposed a course in science, and now he became a science teacher in high school. For journalists, we go to journalist schools, but when we look for jobs, we realize that the good editors, they don't like people from journalist school, they prefer people coming from science faculties. So, it is really the future of science in making a, a lifelong career waiting for the Nobel Prize award which, which will never come, or is it to fertilize all other fields of knowledge and action with a good scientific background at the start? And at the start might be primary school. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting question. Is someone here for you who would like to take that directly? We need everything. We need the Nobel laureates. We need to plant the seed in, in primary education. That's the complexity of what we are trying to achieve, that we have big problems that need directive science, uh, technology that has not been discovered yet. So we need to keep pushing for blue sky research. But at the same time, it's critically important what you're saying about planting the seed. My main concern, to be honest with you, is that science is becoming a big divider. What I mean with that is that now only a, few, a privileged few can access the equipment, the talent, and the facilities to do cutting-edge research. And many people, many from the global south, but also many people within the global north, don't feel invited to the science party because they don't have the equipment, they don't have the resources, they don't have the talent. So science only happens, cutting edge research, only happens in tiny universities. And it is my concern that science is becoming a divider because only the ones that are going to be doing the big discoveries of the future are going to be creating the companies that will transform the industries in this century. So we need to be very worried about making sure that those discoveries can happen everywhere, that everybody feels invited to science, not only in primary school, but also the ones that have already decided to devote their lives uh, to science, that they don't need to leave their countries. And even those who, like myself, move to another country to do their research, that we can do it. Because otherwise, science is going to be contributing to increase the gap between the haves and have-nots. So first of all, thank you very much. I believe that that comes around again because that is also where we have to learn about communication skills. It's not only, so, so, so science will become important for policy as soon as the community and, and the, the population really believes in science because then politics cannot duck from it at any point if, if, the, if the population and the community really supports it. So we really have to practice our communication skills every day and that also starts with listening. So listening to you, to all of you, so one, one question I have, because I was, I was assured by one of the main organizers of the event that apparently I'm the youngest person who will sit in front, uh, in front of you for the, for the day. So since I'm the youngest person, one, one question I would have is how can the early career people, the really young people, work together with the, with the senior scientists and what can the impact of early career scientists in senior societies really make for policy advising? So what, how can we in collaboration with the, uh, with the senior scientists, 
really play a role together and what can what can that collaboration maybe bring to the table so that so that the politicians listen to us more carefully when it's maybe both of us I, I, I know that that's a very complex question I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, yeah, please that would be really interesting so one one of the things I'm really struck by from your from that question and your, and your answer about planting seeds is we need to be planting seeds but we also need gardeners we need gardeners who can cultivate those seeds, who can create the right environment. Um, and I think that probably speaks to Heidi's point as well about the way that senior mentors need to be cultivating and creating gardens where early career researchers can thrive. And so I guess there's, there's, that, there's that aspect. And then there's also something about the mindset um, that e I think every single one of us has to have. I think often we're in science because we're curious, we want to discover things. Um, but we must always keep that curiosity. So I talk a lot about um, the way that if we imagine universities and the science community as a meadow, we need bees in that meadow. We need bees to be traveling from different discipline, touching shoulders with, with people who have different perspectives. Um, and that will ensure that the meadow thrives because bees pollinate as they go. Um, and it will also create honey, which is the most exciting thing ever because that's a transformation of all those different insights into something that really, really connects with where people are at, policymakers, those in um, government, but also those in industry. So I guess the advice is be more B. Be more B. But uh, let, me, let, let me answer your question because I don't want that question to go and answer. You know, what's the or how to involve early career scientists, young people in policy making? The first thing we I need to say is that most people in the world are young people. They are not the exception. They are the majority, especially in Africa and Latin America, Southeast Asia. So if policymakers don't listen to young people, one, their decisions are not going to be democratic. They are not going to be decided by the majority. But even more importantly, young people are going to feel disengaged. And what is worrisome is that in many countries, young people don't feel that democracy and policymaking is that important. Uh, do you will remember the, the survey by the New York Times where you were asking people at different age ranges and as you become um, younger, um, people feel that democracy is less important. So if we want to improve the quality of our democracies and policy making, involving young people, and not just because of the diversity quota, but because they are the ones that are going to be suffering or taking advantage of those decisions is critically important. If not, the quality of our democracies are going to keep deteriorating, and that's a real concern. And another comment, if, if I may. Please. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The young scientists are going to be the future scientific advisors, and they are going to be the future seniors in scientific academics. And regard, regarding to your question, just a short comment for the current young scientists like yourself and others in the room. My main advice is organize and unite you together. One single voice is not that powerful, unfortunately, but if you are you united, that's different. So as a union, as an organized um, entity, it is more likely that the senior scientists will hear you. Just to add one sentence. Um, so both young scientists, as mentioned by Felix, but also students. Um, and uh, in, my, in my experience, I worked many times with students, and that's very, very important because uh, young people bring uh, different perspectives, uh, think out of the box. They're more creative in the questions that they ask uh, and also the directions of uh, research but also in order to make societies and policies more inclusive. We need everyone's perspective to understand what are the challenges that they face and then try to act together on them. Okay, yes, thank you very much. I Can you hear me? Yes, now, now it okay. works, thank you very much. So since we have, since we have just be beautifully heard from all four of you, I also have to wrap up the panel because we're already out of time. As you can see, there are many 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 more questions i have like 100 more questions on my on my sheet which i would love to ask you please if you have more questions for us come during the coffee break come over to us we can 
we can get together and we can we can chat about all this all of these questions. It's really really an engaging topic. I thank all of you very much for being on the panel. We have just heard we should be more international bees, so let's keep that in mind. Keep that keep that to our hearts. And also thank you thank you very much to the organizers and to the master of ceremony for giving us the time and opportunity to speak about this very important topic. So please join me for a little applause for all of our panelists.